Hey guys, welcome back to Moe's Game Table. Today we're going to take a look inside Littoral Commander Indo-Pacific. This is a game designed by Sebastian Bay and is published by the Dietz Foundation. Now this is a game I've been waiting for for quite a while because I had the opportunity to play it back before it was even considered for a commercial release when it was titled FMF. And it was a game that stayed with me because it deals with the Marine Littoral Regiment, a center point of Force Design 2030 in the core. And I just had a lot of thoughts go through my head after playing it, which to me is the mark of a really good design when you not only play it and enjoy it, but then you're thinking about it afterwards. And it was making me think not only from the game perspective, but also how that translates to the real world. And of course, a game is an abstract version of what goes on in the real world. But still, it is a representative model of what goes on in the real world as well. So that's why uh, it really made me think. And uh, that's why I was really looking forward to getting it so I can dig into it a little bit more and maybe answer some of the questions that I have from playing. So let's take a look at the back of the box and see what this game's all about. Littoral Commander is a sandbox style card driven game permitting players to explore potential near future conflicts in the islands and waters of the Indo Pacific. Designed to be picked up and played quickly, by experienced gamers and novices alike. Littoral Commander can be played by two to six individuals, with players taking the role of overall commander or task force commanders. One side controls the forces of the United States, while the other takes the role of the People's Republic of China. Can you manage the necessary coordination of land, sea, and air forces required for winning? Are you able to achieve battlefield success while keeping in mind world opinion? Littoral Commander gives you that chance. And you can see here an example of the maps the cards, the counters, and the four maps that are included. We have the Luzon Strait, Malacca Strait, Ryukyu Islands, and the Taiwan Strait. Components, we get a rule book, scenario book, the four maps we just talked about, assorted cubes, supply discs, three decks of cards, 196 counters, about 10 submarine trackers, and three player aids. It is for ages 14 and up, for two to six players, and it plays between 45 and 240 minutes. So let's take a look inside and see what we get. All right, we have our rule book, the scenario book, our maps, all four of them. And we have our Cubes, discs, bag of dice, and a whole bunch of cards. And status boards for different units. And we have our player aids and two counter sheets. So let's set up the maps and take a closer look at the game. And we'll take a look at the maps that come with the game, starting off with the Luzon Strait. We have the northern portion of the Philippines here, bordered on the left by the South China Sea and on the right by the Philippine Sea. To the north, we have the Babuyan Islands. And at the top of the map, we have the Turn Tracker. First thing everyone's going to say is, how come this map is so colorful? How come it looks like this and it doesn't look like a standard map that we're used to seeing, like that overhead satellite image or that artist-drawn map where you see all the terrain? The intent of this game is to be an educational war game, and the easiest way to have everybody jump right in and not be overwhelmed by your standard terrain effects chart is to color code it, which is what Sebastian did here. Everything in blue and green, that's going to be one movement point. The yellow is going to be two moving points, orange is going to be three, the brown is going to be four, and the red is going to be impenetrable or impassable terrain. That's going to be like your high mountain peaks, things like that. The brown itself is going to be just your standard mountains, and it's just going to descend all the way down to your flat terrain, the green, and of course the blue, which is the ocean. Not only is it color-coded to make it easier, but you have your terrain effects chart, which is going to explain that here as well, what the movement point costs are going to be. It also tells you what the effect on combat is. Effects on combat don't come into play until you get to the orange. And that's three movement points to enter. It reduces the attacker's combat value by one. And then the brown is four movement points to enter. And it reduces the attacker's combat value to two. This is really good for a couple of reasons. Number one is at a glance, you know what your movement points are going to be. 
On top of that, on the map itself, it also has what the movement point costs are. So you don't even have to look down here. The only thing you need to remember is what the attacker values are going to be. And again, that only happens in three and four. One and two is all you need to remember. So very easy to remember at a glance. Again, educational war game, which means that non-war gamers can jump in and they don't have to like do a deep dive into understanding a train effects chart and things like that. At a glance, you can see things and you can understand the brown. This is going to be your more defensible terrain. So you want to put troops there. Maybe get yourself over here where they, it's a, impassable here and you got really great defense position there. So just things like that. At a glance, it makes it easier for everyone to understand the scope of the battlefield. So I think that's a really good design choice. The bottom left here, we have the Western Naval positions. And on the right, we have the Eastern Naval positions. Then, of course, we have your map key here, which gives you major roads, secondary roads, railways, major cities, towns, bridges, ports, and airfields. Very simplified terrain effects chart, very simplified map key. Above that, we have the influence meter. And this is really interesting. It starts off at zero, and then it goes to the left for the United States, and it goes to the right for the PRC. As you take out units, you're going to gain more influence. As you gain influence, you're going to gain more command points, more action points, and then you get real high up on the influence meter, you're going to get extra JCCs, which are the joint capability cards. We'll get more in depth on those later, but those are different types of assets that can aid you on the battlefield. The next map is the Malacca Strait, and you can see the terrain is much more prohibitive here at the south than it is in the north. So again, that color coding comes in handy just at a glance, not needing to go into the tank, you can just see where the tougher areas are going to be, the more defensible terrain is going to be, and also the impassable terrain. Next, we have the Taiwan Strait, where we have a portion of the mainland of China, and then the island country of Taiwan here. And the final map is going to be Ryukyu East. As you can see, a lot of open ocean on this one. These are the Japanese islands. You have the Tokara Islands, Amami Islands, and the Okinawa Islands. East China Sea to the left and the Philippine Sea to the right, Miyako Strait at the bottom. Next up, we're going to take a look at the JCCs that I talked about before. Remember when we were talking about the influence meter and how you gain command points? Well, those command points are going to be used to pay for these JCCs, these joint capability cards. And these cards are going to serve multiple functions. At the top, you see the color coding along the top. That's going to tell you the function of the card. Red is for fires, green is for maneuver, purple is going to be for interception, blue is information operations, and then yellow here and here, that is for your C3 things like command control communications, computers, cyber intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, which is also called C5 ISR. The number at the top is going to be your cost and command points. Below that is going to tell you what the function of the card is, and then below that you're going to have some flavor text. And I want to take a look at two of the cards specifically so you can see how they interact. At the top, we have the American cards. At the bottom, we have the Chinese cards. You have Anglico here. This is your Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company. This is going to require a ground unit. It increases your host unit HP by one, so your hit factor goes up by one. And once per turn, increases your LRS, which is your long-range strike value, by three against any one hex. Over here, you have Breaking Link 16. Roll one die on a one through three, reduce all enemy LRS combat values by half, rounding down for this turn. If combined with another successful cyber or EMS card this turn, extend the effects of this card for one additional turn. So you can see how they do interact with each other. You've got Anglico, which is going to give you a little bit of a boost. You've also got your information operations, which is going to counter the benefit that Anglico gives. This is one of the more interesting aspects of the game is choosing your JCCs, obviously in secret, and then playing them out and seeing how they do interact with each other and if both sides have the capabilities that they need for the specific engagement. And we'll take a look at a few examples of the event cards that come with the game. These will come into play and change things up, as you'll see by looking at these cards. First one here, mudslides. Each team places one gray cube in any two land hexes. The resulting hexes are now permanently impassable. So you can influence the shape of the battle space when this event card comes into play. Next one, monsoon. A monsoon suddenly gathers strength in the region, bringing heavy rain and flooding. All aviation JCCs are now unavailable for the game. So if this event comes in and you've got aviation JCCs, well, guess what? Those command points that you spent on those are no longer any good for the rest of the game. I like how that models the effect of weather on combat. Fleeing masses. Each team places three gray cubes on any three land hexes. Hexes with gray cubes are now impassable. Same as we saw with the mudslides card. 
At the end of each even number turn, roll for each cube. Move the cube according to the roll. If cubes are sent into impassable hexes, ocean hexes, or an occupied hex, re-roll. The gray cubes cannot be attacked. So that's a pretty cool way of modeling the civilians, the refugees that are exiting the battle area and how it will influence operations for both sides. Then you have International Pariah. Your international campaign to garner widespread support is successful. A coalition of partners have agreed to apply political pressure on your enemy, threatening reprisals for their aggression. For the rest of the game, the side with lower influence now receives only five command points for JCCs whenever acquiring JCCs. So if you can keep the pressure on your opponent, you can gain influence, they lose influence, it's going to affect the amount of JCCs that they can bring to the battle. Then lastly, we have night operations. Darkness is settled in. For the rest of the game, reduce all ground assault values by three and reduce all movement point of ground units by one. And there's a bunch more. I'll let you explore yourself when you get the game, but you can see how these event cards will definitely shake the game up and make it a lot more interesting each play. And the last set of cards we'll take a look at are the unit and formation tracker cards. At the top, we have U.S. forces. At the bottom, we have the Chinese forces. And this is just a kind of a broad cross-section of the different types of units that are out there. It's not every type of unit, because obviously for the Marines, I don't have infantry and things like that out there. Uh, I just wanted to show you the different types of units we've got. High Mars sections, Emmerich section, Marine Littoral Logistics Company, Arleigh Burke class DDG, and then the DDGX. The Arleigh Burke class is a well-known destroyer class for the U.S. The DDGX is going to be the next-gen guided missile destroyer, and this is going to replace the Ticonderoga class, and it'll have both offensive and defensive capabilities, including cruise missiles for land attack and anti-ship operations. And at the bottom for the Chinese units, we have MLRS, self-propelled howitzers, light tank platoon, Type 052D, and then the Type 055 DDG. The Type 052 is a Liang-3 guided missile destroyer, which provides potent naval and land strike capabilities and ASW as well. And the Type 055 DDG is going to be equivalent to a U.S. cruiser class. The Type 055 Red High is a class of guided missile destroyer equipped with a variety of advanced anti-ship cruise missiles, land attack missiles, and ballistic missile defense and anti-air defenses. Next, we'll take a look at the player aids that come with the game. We have two different types. We have the player aid itself, and then we have the submarine operations tracker. On the player aid, we get the sequence of play, and then the core actions below that on the front. Then on the back, we have the remainder of the core actions, as well as a breakdown of the symbology on the cards, as well as the unit symbology on the right-hand side. And lastly, we have the submarine operations tracker, where you keep track of all the different subs in your force, as well as their movement, and then there are different directions down here at the bottom on how to handle different situations with your submarines. Next, we'll take a look at the counter sheets that come with the game. On this first sheet here, we have U.S. forces, and at the bottom, we have some of the Chinese forces, which we'll carry over to the second sheet. These are really nicely done counters, and they're already pre-rounded, so you don't have to worry about punching them out and clipping them. All the information you're going to need is on each of these counters. You're going to have a mix of naval and ground, and then you have different types of administrative trackers at the bottom. And that continues on to the second sheet, where we have the remainder of the Chinese forces. Next, we'll take a look at the rules. This is a 48-page full-color rulebook. On the inside of the front cover, we have the table of contents listing out all the different sections and their accompanying subsections. Start off with the introduction, base scenario and setup, sequence of play, all the steps that you'll follow for that, your planning stage, deployment stage, action stage, everything spelled out for you nice and cleanly, initiative check, and then your game components on page 9. Then we have the unit symbology, which is going to give you a breakdown of what's on each of the counters. At the top left, you have your standard NATO designator. On the right-hand side, your number of movement points. Then you have your combat values on both the left and right sides here. There are going to be different types of combat values. You have green for ground assault, red for long-range strikes, purple is going to be interception, and blue is going to be resupply. If you have the Google symbol, it means it's infinite value or range. Let's look here at the ground assault. This tells you your combat value is 8, the range is 0. Then for your long-range fires, you're going to have combat value of 8, range of 9. Then you have some additional examples here. That carries over to the next sheet. Then we have the unit and formation tracker cards, which we've already looked at. Movement example for you. All explained. Conceal. This is a big thing I haven't mentioned yet, but unlike your standard games where you've got God mode, well, 
your units are concealed in this one. Originally, this game was meant to be a block game where everything was turned over. You knew what your unit was, but the opponent did not. Here now with counters, you can still do the same thing. You just conceal or not conceal. When it's concealed, you can't fire at it. You have to work to reveal that unit, then you can attack it. Then you have your zone of reconnaissance, combat explanation here, ground assault combat, continuing in combat, combined arms attacks, long range strikes, and we have a few illustrated examples. Intercept, that's all I explained to you. Then your tactical network cards, remember with those JCCs. Resupply, how that is handled in the game with a couple of illustrated examples. And then we get into the JCCs in more detail. It's gonna give you all the different pieces of information based on the different types of cards you have. Then you can nullify your JCCs. Then you have your special markers, proxy force markers, ISR markers, mine markers, submarine operations. You have your special operations forces as well, but then we get into submarine operations and that's explained to you here. The influence meter, remember that's gonna reflect world opinion on you as you gain influence, you're gonna get more command points, more JCCs, things like that. The meter dynamics are all explained to you here, event cards. And then we have the special thanks here. Then we have the appendix, your reference sheets for your different units. A playthrough example in Appendix B, which is going to be really helpful when you first get the game. Then the glossary of terms in Appendix C. And that carries over to the back of the rule book. And lastly, we'll take a look at the scenario book. This is a 15 page book. Start off on the front with some instructions and then how to create your custom scenarios. The first scenario here is meeting engagement. And this is an introductory scenario that is only three turns. It's for two to four players, very low difficulty. So it gets you into the flow of the game. You get your order of battle, your objectives, your special scenario rules, and then some facilitator notes. So this is something a little different. Remember, at the beginning of the rule book, it says a grand tactical educational war game. That's what the facilitator is for. They're going to run the game for you. They're going to help you understand the rules. They're going to set up the game for you and answer any questions, things like that. That's the educational part. Then we have Luzon Pass. It is a seven turn limit using the Luzon map as well. You get your general situation, order of battle, and then you have variance objectives and then your special rules. Red Tide, this is going to be in the Ryukyus. Same thing as before, you get your OB, your objectives, and your SSRs. King of the Straits, this is going to be the Malacca Strait map. Blockade Runner in Singapore. The Beachhead, this is for Taiwan. And that is the last in the scenario book. And that is a look at everything you get inside of Littoral Commander Indo-Pacific. This is a game designed by Sebastian Bay and is published by the Dietz Foundation. Well, as you can see, you get a lot of game in the box and it is a really fun game. It's not a difficult game to grok. It's pretty standard as far as war game goes because you got your movement, your combat, all that stuff is handled fairly straightforward to anybody who's played a war game before. If you've not, it's not difficult to understand. Where the game starts having layers of complexity and the depth is in the JCCs, your joint capability cards, because you're going to pick yours in private, they're going to pick those in private, and then you're going to basically put them out there. You're not always going to be revealing them to your opponent either until they do something that you need to counter. That is the cool part right there because you know what you're going into, you've got your strategy and what you want to do when you to your opponent, but the enemy has a vote as well, and they may have something to counter something you want to do, or they're going to do something you don't have a counter for. And I think that's where the fun part is, as well as the complexity, like I was saying, because you're going to be thinking through what you're going to use based on your strategy, or you're going to base your strategy based on what your command points are and the cards you can get. So I think that's really cool. As far as a solitaire game, this is not solitaire friendly because of that fact right there. You've got hidden cards. However, you can still play at Solitaire, which is what I plan to do a lot, because I'm going to utilize the games that I play as a test for different cards. I'm going to have different packages and just go up against each other and see how they work out, because 
This way I know ahead of time what cards I want to use. It'll be a lot faster to set up, things like that. But as I said, this is an educational war game, and I think Sebastian knocked it out of the park for that because it definitely gives you a good idea of the complexities of naval warfare. It's not going to go into all the detail. It's still abstracted like most war games are, but it gives you the feeling of what the difficulties are in a multi-domain environment dealing with all the different aspects of maneuver, combat, command and control, and then all your JCCs, the different capabilities that both nations will have. So I think he's done a fantastic job there, and I'm really looking forward to getting this one on the table again. So if you've been looking for a naval warfare game that's near future, modern era, this is definitely one to check out. Well, I hope that helps you guys out if you've been curious about this one. If you have any comments or questions, post them down below. Thanks for tuning in, guys. See you next time.